start with King County and COVID-19, and I'm really pleased that we could get Patty Hayes today, and surprise, <laughs> Director of King County Public Health during a pandemic, uh, to come and talk with our group. So, Patty, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mayor, and I, it's such a delight to be with you all. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you to each of you for stepping up to this leadership space in an unprecedented time. Uh, clearly, in my career, which has been long, as you can tell from my hair, <laughs> that uh, I never expected to be um, needed to lead the efforts on a pandemic, and uh, it really takes all of us, uh, and King County um, has been a leader in the nation because of the efforts from folks like you and others to really address this. So in my uh, few minutes here, I wanted to give you a quick update on where we're at and being the Recovery Task Force, give you uh, sort of my vision of what we are going to expect over the next few months, kind of the reality check on what we're seeing. And uh, it is my delight that you're meeting with us today because we uh, have really some interesting evolving news coming right now. I think the timing, Mayor, is going to be really good for your recovery task force here uh, to to be speaking with me. And I'm trying to make myself right now uh, more available to spaces like this to have these conversations. So um, let me let me start by uh, thanking Joanne for uh, sending out the link to the dashboard. If you haven't had a chance to look at that, uh, please do. It really has been created as a resource for you um, the, and the public, but particularly for recovery task forces and, and those who are working with mayors and local governments to figure out wh what are we doing, what's happening here. I want to point out a couple of things so that we go into the dashboards, uh, you, you know what's available for you. And we are continuing to improve these dashboards, and so the look and feel of them right now, if it changes, it's because we are adding more information or we're taking input and evolving it so it's more user-friendly. So on the main data dashboard, that is updated uh, after we get the complete uh, view from the state data and then the local reports from all of the labs, uh, usually in the afternoon, somewhere between noon and 2.30. Um, it, uh, it provides you with a look uh, on a day-to-day -day basis over what reports we're getting in on the number of cases. When we do all the fancy uh, key indicator methodology, there's a separate dashboard on those metrics that we're trying to hold to in order to open up more. That methodology is actually based upon the, the date of the, of the positive test. So the numbers, if you added up the numbers on the daily dashboard, you would be calling me and say, hey, those don't match when we see the indicators. What's the math? I've had a couple of uh, math geeks call me and ask me about that. And it's because our data team was back and we do this methodology based on when the person was actually tested positive. And then we have a whole bunch of information on and around when they became ill and their symptomatology. We do all of that data thing in. So um, we have some of that facing to you, but the real difference between the daily dashboard and the key indicators, just at a high level. In the daily dashboard, what I want to tell you we just launched a couple of weeks ago is a overtime geographic piece in there that you can go into. So at the top of the dashboard, you'll see these different uh, um, tabs. Go into the one that allows you to look over time because you can look in your specific area over time what the numbers have been. You can track. So you will see we had the big outbreak at Life Care and we had so many cases that were in uh, the Issaquah Swedish Hostel and Evergreen, et cetera. You'll actually see that hotspot and how it's changed over time. You will see now that one of our biggest hotspots on the east side is in the crossroads area. That's not related to a long-term facility. 
And then the dashboard will also give you uh, a, a look both uh, by um, race and ethnicity, and we have a whole separate one on that. So the data is there for you, and uh, Mayor, as you move forward, I would love to get feedback from you on our dashboards. I would uh, appreciate that from you or, and your staff uh, by email at any time. So let me move now to just give you a quick update. So we moved to phase two just a week ago tomorrow, uh, as you know. And um, Dr. Duchin and I knew that when we moved uh, even into phase 1.5 and into phase two, uh, that number one, uh, we have taken the approach slow and measured so that we're watching the data and we're doing this because nobody wants to go backwards. We want to move forwards. Uh, but we also knew when we opened up that the, uh, the fact that people are coming together and that we are uh, in a, a space where we are encouraging and allowing folks to try and get back to normal, allow the economy to reopen, allow wonderful businesses to get going again, that we run the risk of higher levels of infection. And indeed, we knew the numbers were going to go up, and they have been. We are no longer meeting the metrics on the standard for the number of cases over a two-week period. Um, and that, Dr. Duchin and I knew that we were at risk for this. I don't want you to panic about that. But I do want to say that uh, there's a big difference if we level off uh, and possibly go a little bit better in the next two or three weeks versus if the spike continues to increase. So we're going to be watching this carefully. And what I would caution the Recovery Task Force that you could really help me with is there's a large expectation by everybody. This has been extremely traumatic. It's been traumatic for families who haven't been able to visit their family members in the hospital and in long-term care facilities. It's been traumatic in the fact that we've closed down businesses and businesses are in such deep trouble. We've lost some wonderful businesses. It's been terrible for the arts community. So the pain, and, and I, I really believe this because it's important to me to both know that measure of how we open is a balance between what the science says and what the reality is in, in, in your work, the decisions that you need to help make in the community. Um, so with that in mind, I, I need your help, actually, because one of the important things we're seeing is, uh, and this, there's a lot of reasons why this is happening, but People are very tired of being indoors. They're very tired of, uh, I know I'm tired of being indoors. Uh, and if I asked for a raise hands, I would expect everybody would say, yes, indeed. And as the mayor said, telecommuting and these kind of Zoom calls are, uh, are for those of us that like to be with people, are really hard and not fun. People are really anxious to get out. What we're seeing right now is a major shift in the numbers where it is it is individuals under the age of 40 that are uh, experiencing the larger increase. This is because they are taking higher risk. They are gathering. They're gathering in churches. They're gathering by our parks. They're gathering, having picnic by our rivers and lakes. Uh, they um, are um, going into uh, some of our restaurants, uh, and we're not practicing enough of our social distancing, our physical distancing, staying home if we're not well, and uh, doing the mask work. And one of the key things that I believe that uh, I have to find a way to emerge and your help in this and your thinking will be really incredibly important is how do we help both businesses uh, and actually the faith community and others to embrace this as a community response right now. I really want to work with businesses because right now, if they help me in really being successful with this, even though it's terribly stressful and some very small businesses 
at 30, 40% opening can't, can't make it. It's not economically viable. I understand that. But if we don't really encourage and really help our community to self peer pressure, let me say, um, do the right thing here, and the numbers get bad and we get further outbreaks, uh, we are actually rigging the transmission back so that we have another nursing home outbreak. Because what's going to happen is it probably is going to be a young person who does have symptoms or is early on or very light, cold-like symptoms, goes out to a park, a, bar, a, a restaurant, a, a place of business, transmits that to a number of people, and it then goes to the business owner or the person who works in that business. They take it home, and then it's given to grandma. Grandma ends up in the hospital and dies. That's the reality of this picture. People want to feel like the virus has gone away, and it has not. Bill Gates last night on the one I don't know if you saw all in Washington, the fundraiser last night with the music and, and theater community, um, did a wonderful job being hopeful to say we hope to have a, uh, a vaccine next year. And I hope so, too. And with that gives us hope. But between now and then, our best hope is for really aggressively promoting you being my emissaries out with using masks and with encouraging your community members uh, to social distance. And do and have their fun, but be mindful of that, to have business owners be our biggest emissaries. Um, and, uh, and so it's a strategy I'm going to be emerging with the county executive, talking with him tomorrow. I want to partner with the Sound Cities Association, with every mayor around and every recovery team to figure out how we do this. Because I really believe right now it really isn't public health. We've been out saying these things a lot. You've had the doctors out saying it. You've had the University of Washington out saying it. I tell you what's going to be effective. It's going to be the young person standing in front. It's going to be the faith leader standing in front of their congregation saying, we love our community. And by loving our community, we're doing these steps. So I hope you will talk about that in your plans and how you can be really the hub for that. Uh, because in your area, frankly, you're not necessarily going to see an uptick in a lot of cases. And you're going to, you probably already have faced a situation where it really isn't here. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's here in our community. Well, actually it is. It's working. <laughs> there are no hard borders. We do not have walls that keep us out. And particularly since... You're in an area where it's a wonderful place to shop. It's a wonderful place to come and visit. Um, I want you to have to be like what Europe is doing, which is now saying that Americans are not going to be able to travel to Europe because we're not controlling the virus. Uh, we don't want to shut that down like that. So your help with these key strategies will prevent from going backwards, because that's my biggest fear right now, is with the uptick, if it continues, I don't even want to have that conversation. I'm going to focus on how to be successful. That's the conversation I'm having with the executive tomorrow. You're getting the early picture of that. Um, and then I know you had some questions on testing and serology testing, so let me answer them and then open it up for questions. So the idea of antibody testing or serology testing, we are blessed with uh, places like the University of Washington, which is actually in partnership with us. We're, we are actually in one of the early tests of uh, one of the, what we believe will be a viable serology test. And even though uh, Major League Baseball is, has decided to go ahead and do serology testing, I've been working with them as they look at how to reopen uh, the, the Mariners. Uh, I must tell you that Dr. June doesn't feel we have a reliable serology test for a couple reasons. 
First of all, uh, the science behind it is still evolving. Uh, I'm amazed at how uh, we are learning live time the science on this virus. We started by thinking it was flu-like. It's clearly not flu-like. We thought it was a lung infection. It clearly affects the lungs, but it is a circulatory infection. So when you look at something like a serology test, which is trying to tell you, do you have the right antibodies so that you're protected? You've had it, whatever. You might not have known you've had it. That serology test relies on the fact that, number one, it's identifying the correct coronavirus. Coronavirus is actually a family. There's like five or six of them. COVID-19 is a vicious, really virulent strain that's mutating right now, and it appears to be mutating on the East Coast with a different strain than the West Coast. So these serology tests take a while to get really accurate. So I wouldn't count on that for any of your businesses to use to make sure that that they know who's affected and who's not. I do believe that we will see in the next number of months, within a year, uh, a valid serology test, and your healthcare providers uh, will be trained in how to use those so we can do that. So that's that's, uh, the fact on serology tests. In testing, we're trying to really get all of our providers knowledgeable that they should open their doors in a way to test every one of their patients that is symptomatic or has been exposed. We are looking at the gap areas and we are trying to get what's called open access testing through partnerships like the University of Washington or community health centers uh, to open to folks who are not their own patients Uh, So if folks don't know where to go, they can go and open access places. We have a number of those that are uh, in strategic areas. We just uh, had one opened in the Bellevue area with the partnership with one of our community health centers. Uh, And so we're actively watching uh, that. So you can feel free to call me or email me if you feel that access to testing is a problem in your area. We're trying to watch it in the data hotspots. We know we have uh, hotspots in South Seattle and in Shoreline, uh, and definitely in the south end. We just opened uh, uh, an an access uh, point for open testing in Auburn. I'll be talking with the mayor about that down there. So uh, we have an idea where we believe there are hotspots. Your input can be really helpful with that. So with that, Mayor, I think I covered the list I was supposed to in my 10 minutes. I think I took more than 10 minutes, but I am happy to answer any questions from anyone on the call. Oh, it's fascinating, Patty. You could have talked for another three minutes. I love this stuff, and I think the team I've pulled together is uh, as interested as I am. Um, yes, it's open for questions, so any of the task force members that want to use the chat box, just say, you know, this is Mike, and I have a comment or I have a question. I want to, and while we're doing that, I wanted to thank you for giving us a job to do, which is amplify the message. I think what we have been doing is using our government voice, but not necessarily our community voice, so thank you for that. I want to also thank you for the absolutely unbelievable body of work that is happening in literally months. Um, I hope you get to sleep, but I just cannot believe how fast and how hard everybody is working on it. And I just wanted to um, actually um, give another message out to our team here, and that is that um, it's not just the modeling the good behavior, which you mentioned, which is the physical distancing and the mask. But it's the responsible behavior once you've been notified that you've been exposed. I know it's hard to go back in your house. I know it's hard to bring your kids back in. I know it's hard not to go to work. But if we don't have compliance there, we're just, uh, we're losing. We're just losing. So thank you for all of that. And I am seeing some questions in here. So let's start with... um, Well, actually, there's a comment from uh, Chris up at Swedish who says, great presentation. (laughs) He totally agrees with the serology. But let's start with Jason for a question. And anybody else who would like to have a question for Patty, please put your uh, thing in the the box. Jason, you're on. Okay. Well, thank you, Mayor Polly. And thank you, Ms. Hayes, for joining us this evening. My question is, according to the Daily Dashboard by King County Health, the hospitalization 
rate as well as the mortality rate in King County appear to be declining. However, the reproductive rate as well as the reported cases appear to be slightly increasing. Can you speak to that as why they, it see, is this a less virulent strain? Is there something that's happening with the virus itself on the West Coast? And then as far as what is the impact of that information to King County Health officials such as yourself and your decision making, and what will that do as we continue to reopen safely in the region so we don't have to go backwards? As you mentioned right at the very beginning of your presentation, the slow and steady reopening so we don't have to relive this nightmare in two to three months. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is just a fantastic question. So uh, absolutely correct. Uh, the metrics that you just laid out are exactly what Dr. Duchin and I look at. We actually watch things uh, on a running seven day, if you think of it, a running seven day uh, sort of uh, data look on it to see these trends compared to before. So let me speak to, first uh, to the, the, the hospitalizations. So the hospitals have done a fantastic job. Uh, talk about somebody that deployed quickly uh, to develop uh, excess uh, surge capacity. They shut down a lot of their services in order, which hurt them economically, uh, incredibly uh, hurt them. So to make sure that they could have the capacity that needed and for hospitals like uh, uh, Swedish and Issaquah and Evergreen, it was really essential to have that happen extremely quickly so that we didn't have what happened. It's happening right now in California. It's happening in Houston to a, a good uh, colleague of mine. It's happening in, it happened in New York and it's happening in Florida. What's happening right now, uh, two things I would say. Number one, the demographics uh, have shifted. And if you think that uh, uh, back that uh, under 40, uh, the, the virus seems to not uh, be quite as spicy with them. 80% um, of people will have, you know, lots of moderate symptoms. It's 20%, the, the vulnerable people. The children that have uh, pre-existing kind of conditions and uh, immunocompromised, we're trying to protect by this community strategy. So as we saw over the last weeks, and you can see this on the dashboard, it's really fun to watch. Uh, I play with that over time thing. You can tell probably too much. Um, that as the uh, outbreak shifted to the younger uh, sites, uh, the younger folks, we wouldn't expect a, a spike in the hospitalizations. But Dr. Duchin cautions that uh, hospitalizations actually lag up to two weeks behind the spike. So the spike's been really in the last seven days, so we need to give another week to really see. And in fact, it was five hospitalizations today. Um, that's not huge, but you know, that's up because the last few days has been like one. Um, that's nothing that's scaring me, but we'll watch that very carefully. Uh, and then, of course, the deaths, um, thanks to the work early on by the hospitals in King County and then in New York uh, and working with organizations like the University of Washington, we've learned a lot about this virus. Yes, the virus is mutating, but um, that's kind of science wonky for more further out. What's happening right now is we're, we're learning enough uh, that treatment's changing. So uh, in the beginning, uh, we really put a lot of people on ventilators, um, and, and we've learned that it's probably the best strategy to not put people quite so, I mean, it's hard and you can't breathe. I mean, think about uh, how hard that would be, not have immediate relief, but... We're learning that providing oxygen saturation and placing people in a different position to try and avoid uh, putting on a ventilator can really help. Uh, the the, the uh, rencyclovir uh, is a drug that got approved that, uh, 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 that, see, that see, well, King County, but the whole state of Washington was an early adopter into that. And now um, uh, some uh, the new breaking kind of use of steroids. So we're really, the more the hospitals can, can 
learn from each other uh, and, and move into these treatments. Two things are happening, which are really good. Number one, uh, I'm hoping the stay in hospitals will be reduced because some of these folks ended up in the hospital and, and your next speaker can speak much more eloquently to this. Um, but it was so long. Uh, it, it tied up hospital capacity because recovery time or the time till day. We actually watch the data on when someone uh, came into the hospital and what was the time they died, what the time, how long they were in, so that we can watch this hospital capacity to support the hospitals. So we're hoping that that uh, two things will happen: people will recover faster, uh, but also they're going to recover better because we have better treatments. So that's a long answer to your question, but it's really important stuff. That's great, Patty. Thank you. We also have uh, Shashi with a question. Shashi. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Mayor Polly, and thank you, Director, and all my friends. Um, my question is, although you have answered most of my questions, but uh, <laughs> is it possible for us to get daily data at least for the new cases and the deaths? I, I'm really interested in that. I have not got it on any of our websites. And uh, number two, yeah, uh, I was worried about that, the uh, mutation of the virus, then vaccine really becomes very difficult. Uh, and you already mentioned it's already mutating now. And um, originally there were around five strains or something of this coronavirus which was circulating. Do we know how many strains are circulating in our community here in King County? And uh, then the, because the vaccine becomes a, a real problem about uh, when it mutates. And my comment is that it's not the responsibility of only some people or only those who are administ administrating how to control. I think it's the responsibility of each and every person in the population. We all have to uh, do the right thing. And mm -hmm. we know from experience by now that the mask and distancing is really working. So why don't we just make it a little compulsory so that business can go hand in hand? Because otherwise, business will have to be stopped for some more time. So if these two go in balance, I think we'll have less new uh, new cases as compared to what we can expect when people are not wearing masks and also not distancing and not quarantining in case they are found to be positive. Shashi, that's a great comment. Thank you. Patty, there's a couple of questions in there for you. Yeah, so you know, I think personal responsibility and how you as a recovery task force going to help your community in that. Uh, it's a really important question. I'll say two things. One of the things in our country that I think is really important is that we've always tried to balance personal responsibility uh, with uh, personal rights. And I think that's a great conversation for you all to have um, because this shouldn't be a politicized. I mean, this is this outbreak, it's not a political statement. You know, masks are not a political statement. And I think that you all are perfect folks in the community to talk about that and to depoliticize it. Um, I, in public health, you know, people think I sit up here in this ivory tower, uh, and it really is my pleasure to talk directly with the community on this. Um, there are equity concerns around masks uh, that I get concerned uh, about taking too much of an enforcement and because right now, as we know, with the protests and, and the data, we can see uh, that uh, people of color can be in certain communities um, with police. Um, the statistics show that it's not equally enforced. I have a worry about that. So I need to think about all these things. You need to think about it from your community. You know your community and to get these messages out. So I would much prefer that discussion, debate occur uh, with your great guidance uh, and, and we find a way to, to hit that. In terms of the virus mutating, I, I really don't want you guys to worry about that right now. You know, there's people who are so much smarter than me. Uh, we have one of the top vaccine developers here at the University of Washington. What a blessing is that? I've got to say, I had a chance to talk to her, and uh, holy folks, I don't even talk her language. So <laughs> far be it for me to try and impart anything on that. Uh, Dr. 
uh, can probably do better than me, but I will say that um, they're uh, doing a great job in early trials. There's a number of vaccines that are looking very promising, and the uh, pharmaceutical uh, system is, uh, I, can, I can tell they're getting more confident. Some of these vaccine trials are going to really become positive. They're uh, starting to gear up that they can move into production. So I would hold, I would hold that thought right now. Um, and then I'll ask your other question. Yeah, daily data. So uh, when we get a daily uh, dump, what we, what we get is raw information on testing. It doesn't have uh, a high percentage of information like where the person was employed. A lot of times it doesn't have home address. A lot of times it doesn't have their race ethnicity. So it takes my team taking that data uh, every day and then we deploy through our case and contact tracing to begin to fill in the data. So, um, so no, the answer is I apologize. The way our system is set up, it really requires very raw data to come into public health. So I can do on a daily basis how many cases are being identified. I know how many deaths were reported in the day. Uh, we are finding in other areas of the country um, that uh, I think this, this was actually in Florida, where they're looking back and thinking that a lot of things that were attributed to other things uh, deaths to other things are COVID-related. Dr. Duchin's already done that work, and we feel pretty confident that our death data uh, is pretty solid for you over time. So uh, we're trying to figure out how to get uh, the way that a lab, lab report are done to, to have more data so you could have more real-time data. But right now, you have to look over that seven-day period, and you'll see um, that uh, there's these big bars in some of the data that says that it's unknown. And if you look two weeks before, it might be 4% right now, and two weeks before it was down 5%. That's our work. That's just showing you what we have to do. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to call on City Administrator Bob Quitz for a question, and after him, Pavel is up. And also, sorry, I wanted to welcome Grace to the meeting. I see that Grace is here now. Hi, Grace. Uh, City Administrator Bob Quitz. Ms. Hayes, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, I have a personal question. I have a four and a half year old son who we have kept out of daycare and we are, are, are inching back to going to daycare. What, what do you know about daycares and transmission uh, for younger, younger children? Well, being a maternal child nurse by my background, you've asked right to my heart. Um, so uh, this, uh, this virus in children has been such an interesting story, uh, and it's a great example of uh, research and science in action. I, I would say that uh, we are getting guidance out to daycare as fast as possible because uh, obviously it'll reopen the economy, good child care, and the ability to work with our youngest little, little groups there is just really key. So I've got a team that works uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, child care or learning centers uh, trying to get guidance out so that uh, we've got the teachers ready and the parents can get ready. I'm fascinated uh, to uh, look at the emerging science around children and COVID. It's clear that children under the age of nine not seem to manifest uh, COVID-related illnesses very frequently. Um, that's something we're watching very carefully, and yet we have seen the emergence uh, in the last two months um, of the multi-system um, problem in children that is, uh, you might have heard it called kawasaki light syndrome. Uh, it's multi-system. Um, and we are lucky at St. Children's to have uh, a lead physician in Kawasaki syndrome who's been consulting all around the country trying to figure out what's going on 
uh, with um, with children. There doesn't seem to be a way to identify uh, the vulnerabilities of a child to develop that. Uh, so we're going to watch that really carefully, which means we have to protect children. So the mandate uh, in, that's going to happen in schools, which uh, this reminds me, I'd like to give you all another assignment, if could. We need to support our teachers as we look to how schools are going to open. And teachers are going to need to uh, really be supported as they work to keep masks on children in schools. And one of the best strategies, there was a psychologist on five just a couple of days ago talking to parents saying, you need to start the summer. Take a mask, let them draw on it, put stickers on it, make it fun, practice it now. So that would be a great thing for you to be messaging and being with your teachers and uh, get parents to get kids ready. Uh, because it's not, I don't want to see parents just waiting till the last minute and uh, these poor teachers trying to manage their own masks and a group of kids. So I, I appreciate being able, uh, Mayor, being able to give out another assignment. Thank you for that. We love homework, Patty. I'm just scribbling feverishly. <laughs> that is an excellent idea. There happens to be a school board meeting tonight I was going to attend on video, and I think now I'm going to make an audience comment. So we'll see how that goes. Right on. Uh, really good question. Thank you, uh, Student Administrator Bobquitz. We have quite a few more. So um, next is Pavel, I believe, followed by make sure. Yes, Pavel is up, and then Mike after that. Pavel. All right, thank you. Uh, first of all, if I can just say a couple of words to Wally's question, because me and my wife, we mm -hmm. own a Montessori preschool in Issaquah, and we get asked all the time, new parents asking, what are you guys doing to prevent virus? What's your routine? What, the, what extra stuff are you doing? We tell everybody, virus or not, we always, before, long before all this started we always maintain the same routine that nowadays we ask everybody to do it sterilizing everything hand washing cleaning all the time it's our daily routine so people should not be scared of what they care it was always like that nothing really changed much the only thing different is we just spent extra time on wiping computers for check-in and door handles. Everything else been always routine for us. Thank you, Pavel. So um, as for Patty, thank you very much for your presentation and being with us. Um, personally, for me, I'm absolutely not surprised that we have a raise in number of cases. I think it's natural. People are getting out of their house. People are socializing more. You can't avoid it. It's going to be like that. Because I'm really a proponent of herd immunity rather than immunization in this case, especially as a scientist, I can tell a lot of things about the RNA virus that puts me in a very uneasy situation whether the vi whatever vaccine they will work out, whether it will be working or not. Because mutation rate for those viruses are extremely high. It's almost like I tell my uh, software engineers friends, imagine you write a software program and then every day that software program on every thousands letter, it gets substitution, what your program will be good at. However, we do, I think, we should not really pray for the uh, vaccine. We should really concentrate on our behavior and protect the vulnerable ones. We should always do that, no matter what, in any case. But that's the most important part, I think. The, my question was actually that I was trying to find the answer that I cannot. Like when in early days, when all this craziness started, like in April, out of all people that were tested, and at the time, only people that had severe, like classic, let's say, symptoms for the COVID were tested, nobody else. 
more than 90% of those people tested negative for COVID. What do they have? Good question, Pavel, thank you. So I don't know the reference point on your uh, data, which isn't really relevant uh, for them testing negative. One of the things that uh, is true about testing that you'll know um, is it's all about the timing of it all. And you're right, in the in the early days, in, in uh, March in particular, uh, because we were so short in early April, we were so short on testing supplies, we were centering on uh, people who were vulnerable, actually had like pre-existing conditions, uh, were a certain age, et cetera, and were sick. And then as the testing supplies went up, we, uh, the state opened it up to anybody that was showing any what we call COVID-like symptoms or there's a list, of course, CDC has. You know, I think that Dr. Duchin has looked a lot about uh, what was going on during the flu season. We had an uptick in, uh, in different strains of the flu at different times during the flu season this last year. And he really felt that uh, as one type of flu was the decrease in January. We were seeing an uptick in, uh, in influenza A uh, at the same time. So he's been trying to sort out what was happening during flu season during those months, which would include April, as you mentioned, and when COVID was arising and crosswalk between that. So, you know, there's going to be many books written about the pandemic, just like there was in 1918. There'll be plenty of opportunity for graduate students to do their dissertation on this. So I think just keep referring those questions uh, to the University of Washington and to others that are in that space because we actually need to learn from this I, uh, as we go. Uh, your point is well taken. Thank you, Patty. Um, we have two more questions lined up, and I, I'm going to switch to our next speaker because I want to make sure we have enough time to hear about the Swedish hospital story as well. Um, so anybody who has additional questions, please feel free to email them to Joanne afterwards, and I can Joanne can forward them on to Patty if you think of other things that you'd like to ask. But right now we're going to go to Mike, and we'll, our last question today will be from Grace. Mike, you're up. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pauly, uh, and thank you, Patty, for your great presentation and, and your leadership through what has been an incredibly challenging time. So uh, I spent a few minutes clicking through the dashboard before we started our meeting today, and I'm just really impressed with the way the information is presented. Uh, very readable and understandable and, and very interesting, kind of a data wonk. But I did click over. The one that really caught my eye was the, uh, the panels on kind of the health impacts, the overall health impacts in, in King County, the social and economic um, sec segment. And so a, a little different question, it, it, it is how how is uh, Seattle King County Public Health working with or informing the, the social service providers? Um, because there are some amazing numbers here about increases in need for housing assistance, food assistance, et cetera. Uh, it's kind of the community impacts. And is there something that we can do to help support that connectivity? Oh, what a great question. So thank you for noticing that dashboard. So we uh, actually, EDC put out to a couple of states who they knew uh, had expertise in the area of the social determinants of health to have their data teams do an evaluation specifically on the elements. And because my data team had been working with uh, the Accountable Community of Health, which is called Healthier Here Now, and we've been the data source for them on social determinants of health for the last three years. They gave us that grant. That dashboard you see is the first of our work in this area which will continue. So I work closely with both uh, the Department of Community and Human Services, who uh, is in contact with the social services network uh, and the various coalitions that have informed in different areas of the county uh, to uh, bring together those organizations that are serving in the space you're talking about. What we want to do is to begin to take this data dashboard out 
Uh, right now, I've been briefing elected officials on it. Uh, this was something we used with Dow Constantine from the very beginning. You'll hear him talk more about this. Really, um, is important in looking at the impact when you look at essential workers and, uh, and the impact of the pandemic on essential workers. And when I'm talking about essential workers, uh, I, I am talking about those in care, but I'm also talking about the ones uh, in child care and other essential workers that we've got. So you, you can use this in, in terms of your look at reopening uh, and the influence that you see uh, with the, the natural disparities that we have the way uh, a pandemic affects different groups of people. So um, that will be a wonderful conversation for you to have. We're, we just posted that dashboard just a few weeks ago as our first, uh, uh, first step into it, this brand new grant, so we'll be improving it over time. So give me some feedback over time, great. Thank, Thank you, you, Patty. Great, you're gonna wrap this up. What is your question? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you a lot, Patty, for just coming to speak with us. Um, so I kind of had two questions, but I don't think that they're too long. But my first one is that, um, so I'm a college student, and I know that a lot of kids are going out, and it's just like this is their summer break, so a lot of them are still going out, um, and they think that they're young, so it's okay. Um, and I'm wondering, I've kind of heard mixed data on how safe um, being outdoors actually is, like how much does that actually minimize the risk? And especially with summer and, you know, the weather's getting nicer, I see lots of um, teens out just like, you know, on the beach or on the lake. And some people are saying, oh, when you're outside, it's like a super low risk. But I wanted to actually clarify with you, an expert, like what is actually the risk there and how, like what precautions need to be taken? And then my second question is, when is the time period that the virus is mainly spreading? Is it like when you're showing no symptoms still? Or is it people that have already started showing symptoms, but they don't know it's COVID or they're not really being responsible about it? And so like, in terms of testing, what should make you, what should prompt you to get a test? Like, I feel like that's kind of hazy right now. Like a lot of people are like, I guess there's testing is more accessible now, but should I be doing it? So Yeah, and the important message for you all as a task force to, to really think about how you can help with the testing one. So let me start the, the last question. So we know that people can spread the virus a couple of days before they start with symptoms, which is why we're encouraging people who have been with someone who's tested positive to go ahead and get tested. And it's also why we're doing multiple rounds of testing with things, or some employers are deciding to do, like Mariners, they're doing an extremely aggressive testing of their players and staff um, because they're traveling around, et cetera. So um, we need to encourage people, obviously, if they are showing symptoms of COVID-like uh, uh, symptoms to get tested. But if you've been around somebody and you know, or if you've been in a crowd and people weren't social distancing, you're going to see more and more as we get something more available, encouraging people. And I think some of the healthcare providers are going to be, particularly for vulnerable people, we need we need to protect uh, protect those. That's come up a number of times today. And the, the way we do that is if people are ill, they don't go out. If you go out, you wear a mask. You social distance, you take care of your family. Um, so we just can't repeat that enough. Go to the outside. So I get this question a lot. I'm glad you asked it. So you, we know that the, that the virus can be inactivated if it is in bright ultraviolet light. So if you had the virus on your car and your car is sitting outside, that's not a danger right there. Um, but that's really different than if you're with 30 other people staying outside a restaurant waiting to get a table and nobody's wearing a mask and nobody's social distancing. So I'm trying to help people understand the fine nuance on this one. I walk outside and I'm just by myself, and, you know, and I'm in the middle of the road and there's no cars running around. Nobody's running around. It's not a problem. And, um, They've done some research on people who are running 
And when you're running and you're breathing hard, what the boom is, we're trying to figure out the boom. And so if you go on YouTube, you'll see silly, scary things. But, you know, um, the, that's why you need to social, you need to physical distance people. Runners need to be mindful, not to run right by people. You need to space out. So the thing about out of doors, uh, you can see that, that the virus doesn't care that it's 107 degrees in Phoenix right now. It's, it's not dependent on spring, summer, winter, fall. It, it really is unfortunate. We were hoping. We know that there are some things that deactivate the virus, but it doesn't take the place in young people your uh, modeling and the voice you bring for young people to protect themselves right now, because I got to tell you, um, I know people would feel terrible if their grandma died. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't get very sick, if they killed their grandma because they brought coronavirus home, they would be devastated. And we have to be blunt and tell those stories because I talk to those families. It's a truth. Thank you, Patty, and thank you, Grace. Those were excellent questions. I'm just going to do a little time check here. We have 35 minutes left to go. We have another speaker, and we also have our city administrator wanting to do the work plan. So, Patty, I want to thank you for all the work that you're doing. It is amazing for carving out a piece of your day to come and chat with this group, which has been a fantastic help to myself and the city as far as how, uh, how and when we're going to reopen. Feel free to join us if you'd if stay with us, if you'd also like to hear from Chris at Swedish. But if you can't, we totally get it. <laughs> we are still so in a pandemic. Everybody. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Best Patty. Wishes. Thank you. And now next.